So, I'm Lorelei Arisis, if you don't know me. Um, and if you don't know me, thanks for taking a chance on this weirdly random live stream broadcast. Um, and, uh, and, and tuning in for uh, this reading of this historic queer document. Ooh, hey! Right. Thanks. Uh, you would not believe the setup I have, um, like a mini movie studio in my room. Anyway, I know I can talk fast. So, um, what I'm going to be doing is reading uh, a document, um, a zine called Queers Read This. Um, and it was originally written by and published by and distributed by Anonymous Queers uh, at the 1990 um, New York City Pride March, uh, which makes it 30 years old this year, um, which is one of the reasons uh, I felt like it was important to read it. Uh, it's also the, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Crisp Christopher Street Liberation March, uh, which was held to commemorate uh, Stonewall just a year before that. Um, and so it feels like a whole sort of ganging up of important moments that intersect with this document, uh, with this piece of our history. Um, and what this piece of our history is, um, besides a thing, besides a document, um, is it was a manifesto. Um, it was something I found a few years ago. If you um, don't know me, I also have written for years a column called Ask a Trans Woman for the Rainbow Times. A big shout out to independent queer uh, news sources. Um, go follow them, support them, um, and, uh, and read my column. Um, but what I was doing, I was doing a little bit of research. I was curious about where uh, and when we started really reclaiming the word queer for ourselves. Um, and in that research, I came across this document called Queers Read This with an exclamation point. Um, so I read it because uh, I'm, you know, susceptible to suggestion, I guess, uh, and curious. And it had a huge impact on me. If you've read my writing in the past or, or heard some of the speech, political speeches I've given, um, uh, you can hear its DNA in my writing and my words. Um, it, it's hugely inspirational to me. I read it before I march uh, for queer rights and trans rights and LGBTQ plus rights. I read it before uh, I write um, and I feel that it is particularly relevant at this moment in time. 1990, when Queers Read This was written, was the height of the AIDS epidemic. We were just deep in it at that point. Uh, and it was when ACT UP was really um, getting its feet uh, as an organization fighting, um, fighting for queer liberation. Um, and we were starting to really come out of the shadows and say that we're not going to live in those shadows anymore. We're not going to be there anymore. Um, and so this document, which uh, parts of it will parts of it will sound a little dated. I haven't edited or changed anything. It's still pretty binary. There's a lot, despite using uh, the phrase queer in a recognizable way. There's a lot of use of gay or lesbian as sort of umbrella terms uh, in it. Um, and uh, very little mention of trans people. Um, and a lot of mention of the AIDS epidemic and uh, things going on in 1990 that were relevant to that. Um, and, and there are a few things that come across as dated and maybe even hard to hear now, 30 years on. Um, but we owe this place we're at in part to those seeds that they were planting then. So I would ask you to um, to listen uh, and try and keep an open mind and try and uh, 
keep an open ear to it and hear the words you know now in the words they used then. And so after I finish reading, uh, I will stick around and see if I can manage to take some questions or talk to you all. Uh, like I said, my fiance Becky is looking at the feeds, but I'm not. I'm just talking to you. So I'm going to get started with reading. And in all irony, in front of all of these books, um, I have to read this from an iPad, which is sort of weird. Um, but uh, it was. I, if anybody has a copy of Queers Read This that they want to send to me, like I would, uh, it would be an amazing thing to have a real, honest to God's copy of that original pamphlet. But what I have uh, is the internet, and it also means that you can find this yourself. So let me drink some water <clears throat> and get started. I love you all. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Ah. Queers Read This, published anonymously by Queers. How can I tell you, how can I convince you, brother, sister, that your life is in danger? That every day you wake up alive, relatively happy and a functioning human being, you are committing a rebellious act. You, as an alive and functioning queer, are a revolutionary. There is nothing on this planet that validates, protects, or encourages your existence. It is a miracle you are standing here reading these words. You should, by all rights, be dead. Don't be fooled. Straight people own the world, and the only reason you have been spared is your smart, lucky, or a fighter. Straight people have a privilege that allows them to do whatever they please and fuck without fear. But not only do they live a life free of fear, they flaunt their freedom in my face. Their images are on my TV, in the magazine I bought, in the restaurant I want to eat in, and on the street where I live. I want there to be a moratorium on straight marriage, on babies, on public displays of affection among the opposite sex and media images that promote heterosexuality. Until I can enjoy the same freedom of movement and sexuality as straights, their privilege must stop, and it must be given over to me and my queer sisters and brothers. Straight people will not do this voluntarily, and so they must be forced into it. Straights must be frightened into it terrorized into it. Fear is the most powerful motivation. No one will give us what we deserve. Rights are not given, they are taken, by force if necessary. It is easier to fight when you know who your enemy is. Straight people are your enemy. They are your enemy when they don't acknowledge your invisibility and continue to live in and contribute to a culture that kills you. Every day, one of us is taken by the enemy. Whether it's an AIDS death due to a homophobic government inaction or a lesbian bashing in an all-night diner in a supposedly lesbian neighborhood. An army of lovers cannot lose. Being queer is not about a right to privacy. It is about the freedom to be public, to just be who we are. It means every day fighting oppression, homophobia, racism, misogyny, and bigotry of religious hypocrites and our own self-hatred. We have been carefully taught to hate ourselves. 
And now, of course, it means fighting a virus as well. And all those homo-haters who are using AIDS to wipe us off the face of the earth. Being queer means leading a different sort of life. It's not about the mainstream, profit margins, patriotism, patriarchy, or being assimilated. It's not about executive directors, privilege, and elitism. It's about being on the margins, defining ourselves. It's about gender fuck and secrets, what's beneath the belt and deep inside the heart. It's about the night. Being queer is grassroots, because we know that every one of us, every body, every cunt, every heart and ass and dick, is a world of pleasure waiting to be explored. Every one of us is a world of infinite possibility. We are an army because we have to be. We are an army because we are so powerful. We have so much to fight for. We are the most precious of endangered species. And we are an army of lovers because it is we who know what love is. Desire and lust, we invented them. We come out of the closet, face the rejection of society, face firing squads just to love each other. Every time we fuck, we win. We must fight for ourselves. No one else is going to do it. And if in that process we bring greater freedom to the world at large, then great. We've given so much to that world. Democracy, all the arts, the concepts of love, philosophy, and the soul, to name just a few from our ancient Greek dykes, fags. Let's make every space a lesbian and gay space. Every, every street a part of our sexual geography. A city of yearning and then total satisfaction. A city and a country where we can be safe and free and more. We must look at our lives and see what's best in them. See what is queer and what is straight and let that straight chaff fall away. Remember, there is so, so little time, and I want to be a lover of each and every one of you. Next year, we march naked. Anger. The strong sisters told the brothers that there were two important things to remember about the coming revolutions. The first is that we will get our asses kicked. The second is that we will win. I'm angry. I'm angry for being condemned to death by strangers saying, you deserve to die and AIDS is the cure. Fury erupts when a Republican woman wearing thousands of dollars of garments and jewelry minces by the police line, shaking her head, chuckling and wagging her finger at us like we are recalcitrant children making absurd demands and throwing temper tantrum when they aren't met. Angry while Joseph agonizes over $8,000 and over for AZT, which might keep him alive a little longer, and which makes him sicker than the disease he is diagnosed with. Angry as I listen to a man tell me that after changing his will five times, he's running out of people to leave things to. All of his best friends are dead. Angry when we stand in a sea of quilt panels or go to a candlelight march or attend yet another memorial service. 
I will not march silently with a fucking candle! And I want to take that goddamned quilt and wrap it and wrap myself in it and furiously rend it and my hair and curse every god religion ever created. I refuse to accept a creation that cuts people down in the third decade of their life. It is cruel and vile and meaningless and everything I have in me rails against the absurdity, and I raise my face to the clouds, and a ragged laugh that sounds more demonic than joyous erupts from my throat, and tears stream down my face, and if this disease doesn't kill me, I may just die of frustration. My feet pound the streets, and Peter's hands are chained to a pharmaceutical company's reception desk while the receptionist looks on in horror, and Eric's body lies rotting in a Brooklyn cemetery, and I'll never hear his flute resounding off the walls of the meeting house again. And I see the old people in Tompkins Square Park, huddled in their long wool coats in June to keep out the cold they perceive is there and to cling to whatever little life has left to offer them. I'm reminded of the people who strip and stand before a mirror each night before they go to bed and search their bodies for any mark that might not have been there yesterday, a mark that this scourge has visited them. And I'm angry when the newspapers call us victims and sound alarmed that it might soon spread to the general population. And I want to scream, WHO THE FUCK AM I?! And I want to scream at New York Hospital with its yellow plastic bags marked Isolation Linen Ropa Infectiosa and its orderlies in latex gloves and surgical masks skirting the bed as if its occupant will suddenly leap out and douse them with blood and semen giving them to the plague. And I'm angry at straight people who sit smugly wrapped in their self-protective coat of monogamy and heterosexuality, confident that this disease has nothing to do with them because it only happens to them. And the teenage boys who, upon spotting my silence equals death button, begin chanting, Faggot's gonna die! And I wonder who taught them this. Enveloped in fury and fear, I remain silent while my button mocks me every step of the way. And the anger I feel when a television program on the quilt gives profiles of the dead and the list begins with a baby, a teenage girl who got a blood transfusion, an elderly Baptist minister and his wife, and when finally they show a gay man, he's described as someone who knowingly infected teenage male prostitutes with the virus. What else can you expect from a faggot? I'm angry. Queer Artists Since time began, the world has been inspired by the work of queer artists. In exchange, there has been suffering, there has been pain, there has been violence. Throughout history, society has struck a bargain with its queer citizens. They may pursue creative careers if they do it discreetly. Through the arts, queers are productive, lucrative, entertaining, and even uplifting. These are the clear-cut and useful byproducts of what is otherwise considered antisocial behavior. In cultured circles, queers may 
quietly coexist with an otherwise disapproving power elite. At the forefront of the most recent campaign to bash queer artists is Jesse Helms, arbiter of all that is decent, moral, Christian, and American. For Helms, queer art is quite simply a threat to the world. In his imaginings, heterosexual culture is too fragile to bear up to the admission of human or sexual diversity. Quite simply, the structure of power in the Judeo-Christian world has made procreation its cornerstone. Families having children assures consumers for the nation's products and a workforce to produce them as well as a built-in family system to care for its ill, reducing the expense of public health care systems. All non-procreative behavior is considered a threat. From homosexuality to birth control to abortion as an option, it is not enough, according to the religious right, to consistently advertise procreation, and heterosexuality. It is also necessary to, to destroy any alternatives. It is not Art Helms is after. It is our lives. Art is the last safe place for lesbians and gay men to thrive. Helms knows this and has developed a program to purge queers from the one arena they have per permitted to contribute to our shared culture. Helms is advocating a world free from diversity or dissent. It is easy to imagine why that might feel more comfortable to those in charge of such a world. It is also easy to envision an American landscape flattened by such power. Helms should just ask for what he is hinting at. State-sponsored art. Art of totalitarianism. Art that speaks only in Christian terms. Art which supports the goals of those in power. Art that matches the sofas in the Oval Office. Ask for what you want, Jesse, so that men and women of conscience can mobilize against it, as we do against the human rights violations of other countries, and fight to free our own country's dissidents. if you're queer. Queers are under siege. Queers are being attacked on all fronts, and I'm afraid it's okay with us. In 1989, there were 50 queer bashings in the month of May alone. Violent attacks. 3,720 men, women, and children died of AIDS in the same month caused by a more violent government, by a more violent attack. Government inaction rooted in society's growing homophobia. This is institutionalized violence perhaps more dangerous to the existence of queers because the attackers are faceless. We allow these attacks by our own continued lack of action against them. AIDS has affected the straight world and now they're blaming us for AIDS and using it as a way to justify their violence against us. They don't want us anymore. They will beat us, rape us, and kill us before they will continue to live with us. What will it take for this not to be okay? Feel some rage! 
If rage doesn't empower you, try fear. If that doesn't work, try panic. Shout it! Be proud. Do whatever you need to do to tear yourself away from your customary state of acceptance. Be free! Shout! In 1969, queers fought back. In 1990, queers say, Okay, next year, will we be here? I hate. I hate Jesse Helms. I hate Jesse Helms so much, I'd rejoice if he dropped down dead. If someone killed him, I'd consider it his own fault. I hate Ronald Reagan, too, because he mass-murdered my people for eight years. But to be honest, I hate him even more for eulogizing Ryan White without first admitting his guilt, without begging forgiveness for Ryan's death and for the deaths of tens and thousands of other people with AIDS, most of them queer. I hate him for making a mockery of our grief. I hate the fucking Pope. And I hate John fucking Cardinal fucking O'Connor. And I hate the whole fucking Catholic Church. The same goes for the military. And especially for America's law enforcement officials. The cops. State-sanctioned sadists who brutalize street transvestites, prostitutes, and queer prisoners. I also hate the medical and mental health establishments, particularly the psychiatrist who convinced me not to have sex with men for three years until we, meaning he, could make me bisexual rather than queer. I also hate the education profession for its share in driving Thousands of queer teens to suicide every year. I hate the respectable art world and the entertainment industry and the mainstream media, media especially the New York Times. In fact, I hate every sector of the straight establishment in this country, the worst of whom actively want all queers dead, the best of whom would never stick their necks out to keep us alive. I hate straight people who think they have anything intelligent to say about outing. I hate straight people who think stories about themselves are universal, but stories about us are only about homosexuality. I hate straight recording artists who make their careers off of queer people, then attack us, then act hurt when we get angry, and then deny having wronged us rather than apologize for it. I hate straight people who say, I don't see why you feel the need to wear those buttons and t-shirts. I don't go tell around telling the whole world I'm straight. I hate that in 12 years of public education, I was never taught about queer people. I hate that I grew up thinking I was the only queer in the world. And I hate even more that most queer kids still grow up in the same way. I hate that I was tormented by other kids for being a faggot, but more that I was taught to feel ashamed for being the object of their cruelty. Taught to feel it was my fault. I hate that the Supreme Court of this country says it's okay 
to criminalize me because of how I make love. I hate that so many straight people are so concerned about my goddamn sex life. I hate that so many twisted straight people become parents while I have to fight like hell to be allowed to be a father. I hate straights. Where are you, sisters? I wear my pink triangle everywhere. I do not lower my voice in public when talking about lesbian love or sex. I always tell people I'm a lesbian. I don't wait to be asked about my boyfriend. I don't say it's no one's business. I don't do this for straight people. Most of them don't know what the pink triangle even means. Most of them couldn't care less that my girlfriend and I are totally in love or having a fight on the street. Most of them don't notice us no matter what we do. I do what I do to reach other lesbians. I do what I do because I don't want lesbians to assume I'm a straight girl. I am out all the time, everywhere, because I want to reach you. Maybe you'll notice me. Maybe we'll start talking. Maybe we'll exchange numbers. Maybe we'll become friends. Maybe we won't say a word, but our eyes will meet and I will imagine you naked, Sweating, open-mouthed, your back arched as I'm fucking you. And we'll be happy to know we aren't the only ones in the world. We'll be happy because we found each other without saying a word, maybe just for a moment. But no. You won't wear a linen, a pink triangle on that linen lapel. You won't meet my eyes if I flirt with you uh, on the street. You avoid me on the job because I'm too out. You chastise me in bars because I'm too political. You ignore me in public because I bring too much attention to my lesbianism. But then you want me to be your lover. You want me to be your friend. You want me to love you, support you, fight for our right to exist. Where are you? You talk, talk, talk about invisibility and then retreat to your homes to nest with your lovers or carouse in a bar with pals and stumble home in a cab or sit silently and politely by while family, your boss, your neighbors, your public servants, distort and disfigure us, deride and punish us. Then home again, and you feel like screaming. Then you pad your anger with a relationship, or a career, or a party with other dykes like you. And still you wonder why we can't find each other. Why you feel lonely, angry alienated. Get up! Wake up, sisters! Your life is in your hands. When I risk it all to be out, I risk it for both of us. When I risk it all and it works, which it often does if you would try it, I benefit and so do you. When it doesn't work, I suffer, and you do not. But girl, you can't wait for other dykes to make the world safe. For you, stop waiting for a better, more lesbian future. The revolution could be here if we wanted it. Where are you, sisters? 
I'm trying to find you. I'm trying to find you. How come I only see you on Gay Pride Day? We're out! Where the fuck are you? When anyone assaults you for being queer, it is queer bashing, right? A crowd of 50 people exit a gay bar as it closes. Across the street, some straight boys are shouting, FAGGOTS! and throwing beer bottles at the gathering, which outnumbers them ten to one. Three queers make a move to respond, getting no support from the group. Why did a group this size allow themselves to be sitting ducks? Tompkins Square Park, Labor Day. At an annual outdoor concert slash drag show, a group of gay men were harassed by teens carrying sticks. In the midst of thousands of gay men and lesbians, these straight boys beat two gay men to the ground, then stood around triumphantly, laughing amongst themselves. The MC was alerted and warned the crowd from the stage, You girls be careful! When you dress up, it drives the boys crazy! As if it were a practical joke, inspired by what the victims were wearing, rather than a pointed attack on anyone and everyone at that event. What would it have taken for that crowd to stand up to its attackers? After James Zappalorti, an openly gay man, was murdered in cold blood on Staten Island this winter, a single demonstration was held in protest. Only 100 people came when Yusuf Hawkins, a black youth, was shot to death for being on white turf in Bensonhurst. African Americans marched through that neighborhood in large numbers again and again. A black person was killed because he was black. And people of color throughout the city recognized it and acted on it. The bullet that hit Hawkins was meant for a black man. Any black man. Do most gays and lesbians think that the knife that punctured Zappalorti's heart was meant only for him? The straight world has us so convinced that we are helpless and deserving victims of the violence against us that queers are immobilized when faced with a threat. Be outraged! These attacks must not be tolerated. Do something! Recognize that an act of aggression against any member of our community is an attack on every member of, our com of the community. The more we allow homophobes to inflict violence, terror, and fear on our lives, the more frequently and ferociously we will be the object of their hatred. You're immeasurably valuable, because unless you start believing that, it can easily be taken from you. If you know how to gently and efficiently immobilize your attacker, then by all means do it. If you lack those skills, then think about gouging out his fucking eyes and slamming his nose back into his brain, slashing his throat with a broken bottle. Do whatever you can, whatever you have to, to save your life. Why queer? Queer! Ah, do we really have to start to have to use that word? It's trouble. Every gay person has his or her own take on it. For some, it means strange and eccentric and kind of mysterious. That's okay, we like that. But some gay girls and boys don't. They think they're more normal than strange. And for other, others, queer conjures up those awful memories of adolescent suffering. Queer, it's forcibly bittersweet and quaint at best. 
weakening and painful at worst. Couldn't we just use gay instead? It's a much brighter word, and isn't it synonymous with happy? When will you militants grow up and get over the novelty of being different? Why queer? Well, yes, gay is great. It has its place. But when a lot of lesbians and gay men wake up in the morning, we feel angry and disgusted, not gay. So we've chosen to call ourselves queer. Using queer is a way of reminding us how we are perceived by the rest of the world. It's a way of telling ourselves we don't have to be witty and charming people to keep our, who keep our lives discreet and marginalized in the straight world. We use queer as gay men loving lesbians and lesbians loving being queer. Queer, unlike gay, doesn't mean male. And when spoken to other gays and lesbians, it's a way of suggesting we close ranks and forget, temporarily, our individual differences because we face a more insidious common enemy. Yeah, queer can be a rough word, but it is also a sly and ironic weapon we can steal from the homophobe's hands and use against him. No sex police! For anyone to say that coming out is not part of the revolution is missing the point. Positive sexual images and what they manifest saves lives because they affirm those lives and make it possible for people to attempt to live as self-loving instead of self-loathing. As the famous Black is Beautiful slogan changed many lives, so does Read My Lips affirm queerness in the face of hatred and invisibility as displayed in a recent governmental study of suicides that states at least one-third of all teen suicides are queer kids. This is further exemplified by the rise in HIV transmission among those under 21. We are most hated as queers for our sexualness. That is, our physical contact with the same sex. Our sexuality and sexual expression are what makes us most susceptible to physical violence. Our difference, our otherness, our uniqueness can either paralyze us or politicize us. Hopefully, the majority of us will not let it kill us. Queer space. Why in the world do we let heteros into queer clubs? Who gives a fuck if they like us because we really know how to party? We have, we have to in order to blow off the steam they make us feel all the time. They make out whenever they please. They make out wherever they please and take up too much room on the dance floor doing ostentatious couples dances. They wear their heterosexuality like a keep out sign or like a deed of ownership. Why the fuck do we tolerate them when they invade our space like it's their right? Why do we let them shove heterosexuality, a weapon, the world wield, their world wields against us, right in our faces, in the few public spots where we can be sexy with each other and not fear attack? It's time to stop letting the straight people make all the rules. Let's start by posting this sign outside every queer club and bar. Rules of conduct for straight people. Keep your display of affection, kissing, hand-holding, embracing, to a minimum. Your sexuality, your sexuality is unwanted and offensive to many here. 
If you must slow dance, be as inconspicuous as possible. Do not gawk or stare at lesbians or gay men, especially bull dykes or drag queens. We are not your entertainment. If you cannot comfortably deal with someone of the same sex making a pass at you, get out. Do not flaunt your heterosexuality. Be discreet. Risk being mistaken for a lezzy or a homo. If you feel these rules are unfair, go fight homophobia in straight clubs or go fuck yourself. I hate straights. I have friends. Some of them are straight. Year after year, I see my straight friends. I want to see them to see how they are doing to add newness to our long and complicated histories, to experience some continuity. Year after year, I continue to realize that the facts of my life are irrelevant to them, and that I am only half listened to, that I am an appendage to the doings of a greater world, a world of power and privilege, of the laws of installation, a world of exclusion. Oh, that's not true, argue my straight friends. There is one certainty in the politics of power. Those left out of it beg for inclusion, while the insiders claim uh, that they already are. Men do it to women, whites do it to blacks, and everyone does it to queers. The main dividing line, both conscious and unconscious, is procreation. And that magic word family. Frequently, the ones we are born into disown us when they find out who we really are. And to make matters worse, we are prevented from having our own. We are punished, insulted, cut off, and treated like seditionaries in terms of child rearing, both damned if we try and damned if we abstain. It's as if the Propagation of the species is such a fragile directive that without enforcing it, as if it were an agenda, humankind would melt back into the primeval ooze. I hate having to convince straight people that lesbians and gays live in a war zone, that we're surrounded by bomb blasts only we seem to hear that our bodies and souls are heaped high, dead from fright or bashed or raped, dying of grief or disease, stripped of our personhood. I hate straight people who can't listen to queer anger without saying, Hey, all straight people aren't like that. I'm straight too, you know. As if their egos don't get enough stroking or protection in this arrogant, heterosexist world. Why must we take care of them in the midst of our just anger brought on by their fucked up society? Why at the reassurance of, of course I don't mean you, you don't act that way. Let them figure it out for themselves whether they deserve to be included in our anger. But of course, that would mean listening to our anger, which they almost never do. They deflect it, or deflect it by saying, I'm not like that, or now look who's generalizing, or you'll catch more flies with honey, or if you focus on the negative, you just give out more power, or you're not the only one in the world who's suffering. They say, don't yell at me, I'm on your side, or I think you're overreacting, or boy, you're bitter. They've taught us 
that good queers don't get mad. They've taught us so well that we not only hide our anger from them, we hide it from each other. We even hide it from ourselves. We hide it with substance abuse and suicide and overachieving in the hope of proving our worth. They bash us and stab us and shoot us and bomb us in ever-increasing numbers and still we freak out when angry queers carry banners or signs that say, BASH BACK! For the last decade, they let us die in droves. And still we thank President Bush for planting a fucking tree. Applaud him for liking, likening people with AIDS to car accident, accident victims who refuse to wear seatbelts. Let yourself be angry. Let yourself be angry that the price of our visibility is the constant threat of violence. Anti-queer violence to which practically every segment of this society contributes. Let yourself feel angry that there is no place in this country where we are safe. No place where we are not targeted for hatred and attack. The self-hatred, the suicide of the closet. The next time some straight person comes down on you for being angry, Tell them that until things change, you don't need any more evidence that the world turns at your expense. You don't need to see only hetero couples grocery shopping on your TV. You don't want any more baby pictures shoved in your face until you can have or keep your own. No more weddings, showers, anniversaries, please, unless they are our own brothers and sisters celebrating. And tell them not to dismiss you by saying, you have rights, you have privileges, you're overreacting, or you have a victim's mentality. Tell them, go away from me until you can change. Go away and try on a world without the brave, strong queers that are its backbone, that are its guts and brains and souls. Go tell them go away until they have spent a month walking hand in hand in public with someone of the same sex. After they survive that, then you'll hear what they have to say about queer anger. Otherwise, tell them to shut up and listen. And that's it. That is, queers read this. Yeah, I know there's a lot about it that's hard to hear. It's really super binary. Um, but there are seeds. You can, you can just, you can hear those seeds of what we're still fighting for. And uh, if you get the chance, I recommend going to read it yourself. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being queer. Thank you for being you. Like the pamphlet says, Every day you are alive is a revolutionary act. Your fucking, your lives, your loves, your selves are a revolutionary act. Existing in this world as who you are 
is a revolutionary act. And I love all of you. Every single person listening to me, I love all of you. Uh, that's basically it. Um, I'm going to see if there's... Does anyone have anything important to say? <laughs> Sweet. Well, I'm going to talk for a minute about where I was uh, with all this, and then I'm going gonna, gonna to go get drunk. <laughs> Write a manifesto, I guess. I, uh, I was uh, in high school. I was a senior in high school in 1990, uh, a junior and senior in high school in 1990, and I grew up on Cape Cod. My, in fact, one of my first jobs was uh, as the janitor for uh, uh, an, an organization of uh, a little cluster of groups that did social work type stuff. Words are lost. And one of those was the AIDS Action Committee. And so even at that point, as a kid on Cape Cod, like I, 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 I knew... This, it was already my community. I wasn't even out yet as being bi or trans or queer or any of the things I am. And, uh, and so when I read this, I remember those people. I remember the gay men I knew who died of AIDS. I remember that being like just behind every gay man I met. And... Uh, when I graduated from high school in 1991, I moved to Northampton, Massachusetts, Lesbianville, USA. And everyone I know had one of those pink triangles or silence equals death uh, buttons and an act up shirt. Um, and it was my community. It was where I, uh, these people, the, the people who wrote these words and lived these lives were my people. Um, and they were, they were how I became the person I am today. I owe, uh, I owe every act of defiance. I owe my life and my love, my ability to be out in the world to the people who died for this, who, who wrote that, who, who spoke and wrote those words many of whom are still with us and a lot of whom are dead. And in this moment where we're facing uh, another plague that disproportionately affects the marginalized, the more marginalized people in our society, black people and brown people and, uh, and queer and trans people too, um, at least, you know, those of us who have refused to become part of the, like, mainstream. Um, and, you know, even Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was one of the first doctors to finally pay attention to the AIDS epidemic, is, is back. Um, and despite the strides we made in the decades between 1990 and now, A lot of those straights are fighting back real hard to take those rights back away from us. And so all of those are the reasons why I felt it was important to remind myself and to remind you of this point in time when we were really starting to take the fight to the public and coming out of the closets. And I want to encourage you to stay out of the closet, to keep fighting. Of course, protect yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. But come out and be out and never stop fighting. And don't forget that you are not alone. An army of lovers cannot lose. Thanks.